today I thought I would cover how to get your soils ready. So you came in for how do I prepare my soils in the mountains. That says something about you, right there alone. I'm a hardcore gardener and I want to get my soils ready so I'm ready to plant. I'm planning, I'm strategy, I'm, that, that's, that's, that's great. So I love hanging out with gardeners. I love cool garden gloves, garden hats. I love everything about gardeners. And so today it's, it's the soil prep. Now for my own personal gardens, I've got all the pruning, pretty much all the pruning is done. So I've finished. Uh, the fruit trees are pruned back, the grasses have been whacked way back. Perennials, I just took the lawnmower, whacked them back to the ground. Actually, I'm seeing already the, the mums are already up. They're already starting to grow, the asters are already up. So some things are already, they're not growing fast, but they're out of the ground they're showing green, which is enough for me, because I'm tired of cold. I want shorts, flip-flops, and like garden gloves. That's what I want in the garden. I'm tired of this long sleeve, multi-layer. I'm ready for some flowers. Uh, so, but it started. When you get all your pruning done, you want to spray it with all season spray oil. So I've not done this one yet. I'll do that probably in the next week. Now I'll put a hose in sprayer and I just hose down the yard. And th what this does, it's the least expensive, most, it's the safest organic spray you can do to kill bugs. But you really want to do it now while it's cold because it sprays and, and it, it coats the eggs that were laid last summer and fall and it, it suffocates the eggs. And then bugs are also harboring. They're actually in the soil. They're actually in the nooks and crannies of the bark. They're in those main crotches of the trees. They're there. They're just not moving very much. Uh, but I am starting to see bees are out and starting to forage a little bit. I saw my first uh, garden spider coming into, into my office. You know, you look at the computer screen. It's like crawling up behind the screen. You're going, whoa, that's pretty spooky. You just caught him and let him outside. This will actually clean that up so when you insects or bugs, so you start out fresh. It's especially important for plants that you had problems with, the aphids and thrip were on last year. So your roses, uh, kale and cabbages, if you're harvesting those, this is organic, you can spray that. Because aphids, that's the first thing they go after. But it's not gonna hurt your pets, the bees, that kind of stuff. So it's very selective. Okay, now there were a couple questions, and you know the class is size. I can't go questions all day long, so. But I'll answer two. We'll start the back. What about trees? Can you tell? Spray this on trees, especially trees. Yeah, should the trees be pruned down already? Yeah. Did you? Okay. So you have now through middle of March. You've got four or six weeks. Don't feel pressured. But like every week I go out and prune a little. Actually what I do is uh, when the grandkids are visiting, the trash can is packed like instantly. It's like full all the time. When they're not at home, they aren't visiting. Uh, Lisa and I use no trash. It's like there's so much capacity. So I just go and I prune until that trash can's full. I am done. Yeah, it's done for today. That's about an hour's worth of pruning. And then every week I just kind of process a little bit more. Uh, I do compost quite a bit of the smaller stuff, grasses, perennials, the soft stuff with the twiggy, pokey, thorny stuff. I throw that in the trash can. That's just, that's just how I do it. Now some of you are good enough you just call your gardener, have them do it. Just take care of this for me. I, I don't have that, so I just have me. And I like doing it, it's kind of therapeutic for me. Go ahead. So I just had a question about, um, is there a printout? Because like, I don't feel like taking notes. You're much oh, you're one of those yeah, gardeners. you're much more interesting to watch speak. <laughs> doing notes. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I have one handout that's on the printer. Like if I see my staff, you know, I got new printers, so we're in this process of getting ready for spring, and I'm not ready. So I bought new printers, new print signs, we have more information than ever. It's going to be uniform, it's going to be consistent, and gardeners are just going to love it. They'll shop more and tell their friends, their friends will come and gar garden with us. Well, it's a brand new printer, I haven't used it yet. And so have you ever tried new technology? I'm in a hurry. How do you get this thing to print? Why do you need more ink already? What the heck? What's going on? So it's still printing. Anyway, here's the, uh, I'll send you a digital copy. How about that? PDF file that you can open on an iPad, screen, laptop, whatever, print it out, you can have it. So put your email, and that'll be later today, and I'll, I'll, I've got a planting guide, and then if there's a couple other things that the class seems to be interested, I'll, I'll attach that. So every time we have a class, we make a, you know, 
No, I said I wouldn't take any more classes. Hold on, hold on. Let me just keep going here, okay? Otherwise, I'll get derailed. I have ADD problems, so I tend to focus like this. Uh, what I want to cover today is soil prep. I do a lot of containers and then raise beds. So I'll tell you what my process is. Here's the things that I use. Here's the things I put in the ground that really make a difference locally for this, this our water, our soil. Then I thought I'd go over how to plant a tree, a shrub, a vine, an apple tree, a bramble, or whatever. How do you plant in our soil? And, and, and just so I'll cover it right now. We're all the same, okay? So let's just take a real quick poll. How many people are gardening in Prescott proper? Oh, most, good. How many in Prescott Valley? Okay, good. How many in Chino Valley? A little less. Oh, the same, good. How many further out than that? Anyone in Cottonwood, Kimber, where? Sedona. Sedona, right on. Actually, Sedona's like been rocking it this week. It must be warming up, so it's like every day we're helping Sedona folks. Where are you all from? Brilliant. Williams, very good, yeah, high country, doing very good. I love that area, best vistas in the county, very good. Except for Chino Valley, they got some good vistas too. Prescott Valley is the only place I've seen three rainbows at the same time. That's awesome out there. When those storms in the summer kind of roll around, it's unbelievable. So anyway, we're all the same. We are a zone seven, okay? Zone seven, except for Williams. You're a zone colder, so you're four five. You're in that range, okay? So you need plants to go down to minus 20. We need plants up here that go down to zero. So it's a little bit different. What it really comes down to when you're planting, the real difference, and you'll see this in your neighborhood, you know you're all in the same zone. What it really comes down to is what exposure are you on that hill? So if you're on a knoll or you're over a vista, you're on a, uh, the east side and south side, will be easier to grow. Actually, east and west seem to be, now where have I had most, most luck? My east side are my easiest gardens. And it's probably my west, direct west, because you got morning sun or into the day. South is just hot. You gotta be careful what you plant. The south stays warm, it doesn't, doesn't frost as much. The frost line empties out earlier. The north side is the hardest. So my house is on a north side hill. It's up in Eagle Ridge, above the high school. It's the hardest gardening I've ever done. Okay, and I've gardened, I've farmed all over the county. From Skull Valley to Chino Valley, everything in between. This is the hardest home I've ever tried to garden. Now it is, it is pretty nice. I've been working this for about 15 years, this house, and it is, you'd walk by and you kind of go, that guy might own a garden center. It looks pretty nice. It, it's, but I had a lot of failures. So I've killed more plants that I probably have in the yard right now. It's part of this experiment. Uh, it's because it's north slope and that hillside is solid clay. So clay, gets snow on it, it doesn't thaw, uh, it's just harder. So that one, my neighbors just on the other side of the hill, they would have less issues because it's sunnier, brighter, it doesn't freeze as much. So it depends more on your exposure than it does your elevation. I'm in Poland, or I'm in Chino, or I'm in Prescott Valley, or I'm in Prescott. That doesn't matter as much. You need plants that can go zone seven or colder. So zones, they go from like one to 12. The higher the numbers, like deserts, we want zone seven, or you could grow zone six, five, four, three, two, one. You want one through seven, most of us, Williams, one through five, one through six, you could cheat it. I do grow myself because I'm a gardener. I like risking. So fun, I get bored, I want to try, oh, that's a neat loop. I wonder if I can get that to grow, and I just, I do that. Sometimes I have success, sometimes I don't. But it's fun to try, that's my passion, gardening. And so I'll try some zone eight stuff. So I've got a palm tree, it's a Mexican fantail palm, at my front door, outdoors, in a pot, and it's thriving, a classic zone eight. It should not grow at this elevation, but gardeners have a way of tweaking it. I've got some uh, fancy cacti, some uh, uh, Moroccan mounds, some different funky, weird cacti. Should not grow up here to zone eight. The mid pots are underneath my overhang. If you come to my entrance, it looks almost Mediterranean. But that's me. When I'm starting my soil, what I start with always is my containers. I do a lot of container gardening. So I've had a couple back surgeries. Uh, when you've had a couple back surgeries to get down on the ground to do digging bars and jackhammers and 
that's not fun anymore for me because I don't want another injury. And so anything bigger than a 15 gallon size or larger, I have my crew come out and they come plant it for me. I'll sit down in a lawn chair, I'll feed them cookies and some tea and I'll chit chat with them. And it makes just training and just making sure it's where I want it, it's faced. But any, anything smaller, I can do myself. I just, I could do bigger, I just don't want to. I don't want to risk it. Uh, my soils, I do all myself. So I don't have people turn it and get it ready. And I have over 50 pots, containers, big glaze. I've been collecting them for decades. And so there's a, a mix in the front yard and backyard. And if you're planting in containers, you do need to refresh the soil in those containers. Plants use up the vitality in the soil. And that's why you're here. But it seems like people don't think that that happens in containers. It happens even more in pots. Uh, have you ever noticed in your raised bed, your, your containers, the soil actually disappears, like shrinks? The plants are using the soil. It's not blowing away. The plants are physically using it up. And so it's disappearing. You need to replenish that. And so what I do is my big pots, anything smaller, let's say this big or, or smaller, I just dump those out, put all new fresh soil. Uh, things that are bigger pots, I don't replace all the soil just because it's too much work. Uh, I just do the top layer of soil in those pots. And, uh, and you'll know the depth to go to because you'll see those old roots from last year. What happens is when roots decompose, when they compost in the soil, last year's plants, the tomatoes, peppers, the marigolds, whatever it was, when those roots compost, they rob or take away from your growing plants uh, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, they take away the nutrients. So you don't want that to happen. You want to take those things, you're going to compost, don't let it compost in the soil, take it put it in a pile over there. So you can control how your plant's going to be fed, the nutrients, you can control the growth rates. That's And some plants, quite honestly, they poison the soil. As the roots decompose, they actually act, add arsenic and strychnine, all kinds of crazy stuff. So you really don't want to know, you don't want that to happen. You want to control the growth. So if you struggle with some of that, it's because of, of the soil just got old. You need to put some freshness in. And so what I do is I'll, I'm going to borrow this chair. I think this is a, a prop. No, you're good. Oh. So I made my own potting soil years ago. In fact, my grower and I, we kind of came up with this recipe. I've been tweaking it. Um, so potting soil are like baking cookies. There's a certain recipe that really works. And in a dry climate, it really gets hairy. So you want a soil that drains, but then holds enough moisture. There's this balance, this razor's edge of, of wet, but not too wet. And so uh, came up with this, and it grows. This is our grower's mix. So our, if you have a tomato that you're buying from us, and you put it in more of this soil, it's just going to go, oh, more of the same, and it just takes off and grows. Plants do not like to go in different kinds of soils. They don't transition very well in different types of soils. They like the same. You're gonna to try to root out the same. So think in terms of that. It's like you getting off on an airplane. You gotta be in New Orleans tomorrow. So I got a business trip, taking my team, I'm gonna do some training education stuff. You ever get off the plane, you know, you're coming from the East Coast, you get off in Phoenix in like August, you kind of go, oh, what's going on? It's so hot. Plants do the same thing with soil. So think in those terms, they, you want to keep that consistency. They don't like blended, layered soil. They like the same consistency throughout. If you can give them the same grower's mix, potting soil, even better. So my top layer, I've already done all my, all my pots are all done. They're ready to plant. I haven't planted all of them because I'm waiting for certain plants to come in. I'm starting to put a few pansies, some kale. We like juicing in the morning, so <coughs> there's nothing healthier than you know, antioxidants of kale, that kind of spinach. We're doing some of those but most of the pots are sitting idle. They're ready to plant, they've got fresh soil, uh, but I'm, I'm taking that top layer, putting fresh pot in soil. Make sense? I'll fill them to about within an inch of the top, so I've got room to, to water at the base. Uh, one mistake I find rookie or new gardeners make, they've got this big pot, they have one bag of soil, they put it in, they still need like another half a bag, and they go, well, I'll just plant. And so the, the plants are like, this far below the edge, first of all, it looks like you ran out of money. <laughs> it looks like you, did, like you didn't quite do it right. There's something wrong with it. You look at it, you go, 
That seems odd. It can grow just fine. This is, health of the plant's okay. It's a look, a design look. It's, it's how it feels when you look at that container. So about an inch from the top seems to be ideal. You'll, tend to, you'll be prone to go a little too much sometimes. It mounds over. So I'm real generous with my plants and my soil. So I get too much and then it becomes hard to water it. So just kind of, that's my tip. So all this potting soil that I gathered up, where do I put it? Because now I've got like two garden, I have these big garden tubs that I use. Where do you put all that extra soil? That old potting soil from last year, I put in my raised beds. And I use, use it as, I spread it out over my raised beds. I'll try to filter out the old chunky roots and stuff. So the obvious things. But mostly, it looks rich. It's some, some organics. And I'll just put it on top of my raised beds. It's not enough. I need more soil than that. It's really a garden tub and a 10 by 10 raised bed is hardly anything. What you really want is a two inch layer two to three inches, what your garden books say, of organic material tilled into the soil one shovel's depth. That's the standard, no matter where you garden at. So I'm gonna go for that. I always start with manure. So, poop in a bag. Uh, I really despise putting gooey cow manure in the back of a Mercedes or Lexus or we have a lot of nice cars that drive the parking lot. Pickup trucks, I don't really care. The last thing I want to do is throw some gooey thing in, in, into the back of some luxury car, and then it stinks up the whole car for the rest of the day. So we made our own pot, we made our own manure. This is cow poop, chicken poop, turkey poop. It's a blend of, it's a blend of poops. <laughs> but you get a more balanced uh, uh, nitrogen source. You get more, more phosphorus as well. That's, one, that's a middle number that allows more fruiting. Um, and we, we mix it with our compost so it doesn't smell. So it's deodorized poop in a bag. I wouldn't mind, this actually feels like compost. I don't mind handling it with my hands. I know it's kind of gross, maybe get some gloves, but it, it doesn't feel dirty. But it's a great nitrogen source in your, in your garden. So I'll go half of this. So for my, my garden, I put three bags of this, and then I put three bags of Come on. A premium mulch. I'm hoping you folks on Facebook can see these. I think I focused it right. A premium mulch. This is our, we, again, we make this ourselves. We've got access to an old sawmill over in Taylor, Arizona. We're harvesting those old tailings. This is, you'll see it's kind of woody, compost, dark rich. Uh, it's great for planting, uh, but it's really great for keeping the, air, the soil aerated so roots can get through it faster. So I blend those two things on top of the soil, then I'm gonna till that into one shovel's depth. That's my formula. Now I'll also tell you that I am super lazy. Okay, I don't like the process, the work of tilling the soil. It's kind of a pain. I like planting <coughs> plants. I like my wife and I planting in the afternoon after church or bringing the grandkids over and watching them butcher six packs as they pull them out. It's just fun <laughs> to watch them play, to teach gardening, that's fun. Get the soil ready, not so much fun. So while I'm doing all this work, I'm also at the same time going to add my nutrients for that soil at the same time. So I'm gonna till that into the soil all at the same time. So I'm saving some steps is what I'm doing. So what I'll do is on top of this, I lay these out on the ground. I'm gonna add pretty much two things, two, three, a couple extra things, let me show you. Uh, one is the food, I sprinkle this, this is a fruit and vegetable food, 100% organic, it's bone meal, meat meals. It's just a bunch of different meal, organic, uh, pelletized food. I'm gonna put that in the ground where I'm gonna grow my, my flowers and my vegetables. And I'm gonna help turn that in with my soil. So now I've front loaded that plant. So when I start putting that new cucumber or spinach or lettuce or whatever it is in the ground, it is just gonna take off new growth. I mean, it'll be, you'll be wowed. Like, ooh, it's taken off. And it's safe for your pets, safe for, it's organic. So it's safer than your chemical uh, fertilizers, okay? So I'm putting that in. A, a problem that we have often is blossom end rot. So you'll see a tomato, an eggplant, squashes like zucchinis, are notorious peppers. They're notorious where that blossom was. 
Uh, they don't pollinate quite right, and they'll, they'll start to blacken or rot. They'll get rotten on the end. So half the fruit's edible, the other half, it looks hideous. You don't want to serve them up on a platter and go, here, try some of my harvest. You don't want that. That's almost always a calcium deficiency in the garden. That's what's causing that symptom. And we're notorious for that at this elevation. The reason why our water is super alkaline, which is going to be, a for you folks in the Midwest, it's going to be a challenge. You're going to be, have to adapt your thinking a little bit because our water is alkaline. Everywhere else in the country is very acidic. So they're trying to deal with acid issues. We're trying to deal with alkalinity issues. And if you had a, a hot tub or a pool, you know, you're always checking the pH uh, to get it just the sweet spot, like 6 7%. Uh, ours always comes out 8 9 I've actually seen 9.2, 9.4. It's basically <coughs> sterile, nothing will grow. If you get in a hot tub with 9% alkalinity, your skin will start to crawl off your body. That's what it feels like. You gotta go in and shower afterwards just to rinse off or you can't go to sleep that night. It's just, it, you can feel it on yourself. Well, roots are the same way. They'll, they won't want to root, they just will stop. Or your plants will start to yellow on you. And so that's all indications of, of the pH got too high. Also what that does is it locks up the minerals like your calcium. And, and it's, the calcium can be there, but the plant can have, have access to it. It's trying to get it, but it can't because this alkalinity is pushing it. So you need to bring that pH, that's why you're trying to check that and have, have the sweet spot. And all your books say 6.5 is the perfect pH. <coughs> Guaranteed, you're never gonna reach 6.5. Not in the mountains of Arizona, our water is too alkaline. So it's going to naturally want to creep, creep up to that 7, 8, again 9. As you go out to Chino Valley, if you're in that upper aquifer, the water's really alkaline up there. And so you just want to get it down below 8. Get in the 7s. That's good. Good enough. I find works for your gardens. And, and, and all of us are the same. It's not like, like all of us have the same water. So we all are dealing with well water. They stuck a straw on the ground, how they distribute it, so the cities have big, big holding tanks, and then they'll chlorinate it and send it out to your tank, to your, to your tap, but it's still the same well water, so we're, we're dealing with the same aquifer, all of us. If you've got your own well, you're just dipping in, you're dipping in the same aquifer, you're just getting the water out yourself instead of having the city do it for you. Um, the reason that it's so alkaline, it's trivia, just so you know, uh, Bill Williams Mountain used to be an old volcano. Uh, Thumb Butte, in the middle of town, that's an old volcano core. All the big hills you see in northern Arizona are old volcanoes, very active. So now all that ash that was around that cone is now filtered down, now it's out in the valleys. So, and then the water has filled up all this ash. So we have a lot of volcanic ash and the water is coming through. We're, we're, that's why the groundwater is so easy to get to. It's coming up, it's really easy to extract from the, from the ash. Well, volcanic ash is really alkaline. And that's what's causing that alkaline. You need to counteract that all the time. If your plants stop blooming, the fragrance is just not as fragrant as you remember it, your lilacs. If, uh, if they start to yellow in June or July, those are all pH issues. You're gonna come in and ask me for iron and I'll sell it to you. But it's not iron, it's soil sulfur. You need soil sulfur. Set, I'm gonna set the stage for this, here we go. So soil sulfur, lowers the pH, so I'll add some of this to my garden bed. Doesn't take very much. One application this spring I find works for the rest of the year, the rest of the growing season. Um, we put a lot of sulfur in our foods already. What I find, it, it helps put a little bit more in the areas I'm gonna do intensive gardening. So I do square foot gardening. I mean, it looks like Jurassic Park. I mean, it's just overgrowing. There's, I love growing giant pumpkins. And so I'll put them on the edges of the gardens and they'll flow out into the yard. And by monsoon season, it's just like pumpkins like this. It looks like a jungle. It's beautiful, it's fun, but it's intensive. So it takes up a lot of food, it takes up more food and water in that small spot. And so I notice if I do this, it really helps to, to bring that pH in line and make it sort of neutral or at least productive, okay? Uh, those are the nutrients that I add. I do add some, some calcium. I mentioned that we have a lack of that blossom end rot. There's two options for that. I'm using calcium nitrate. It's the easiest, fastest calcium 
source it releases a little faster. Your grandparents used gypsum. Here we go. Gypsum is calcium sulfate. That's the active ingredient. So it breaks down much slower, uh, but it, it also works. If you're using gypsum, I would turn it into the soil, then every time I plant a new plant, I would sprinkle a little bit of gypsum at the base. It'll help get enough. If you're doing the calcium uh, nitrate, less issue with that. It's, there's more available, the soil just acts a little bit faster. So that's how I use the different. When you're adding these two things specifically for the calcium. This is important if you're growing tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, squash, um, cucumbers are fine, help, it helps. So not everything needs it. Your leafy crops don't need it as much. Your fruiting crops more. Maybe I should cover the frost dates. How about that? Because we had quite a few new folks. How many were new again? This is your first growing season. There's enough. So you know our zone. Um, our last frost date here in the mountains, we kind of use Mother's Day as that last frost date. And that's a transition between cool season crops and summer crops. It can float. This year it's probably going to be, if the weather holds like this, it'll probably be about the end of April, first part of May. Might not be that May 8th, 9th, 10th zone. Uh, last year was later. Last year was towards Memorial Day. Remember we had that snow? It was cold right through Memorial Day. And everything was delayed. I mean, I had huge tomatoes on the vine, like in September. I hadn't picked one yet. It's loaded, and I'm seeing frost coming around the corner. It was just so delayed that uh, that's just the years. But the average, if you take 100 years of data, the average comes into May 8. That's the last frost date. The problem with averages is 50 of those years, it was the end of April. The other 50 years, it was the end of May. Well, the average is May 8. So, so you know the average. So just be careful. I'll plant early a few things. I'll put a few tomatoes in, and I'll protect them with a wall of water. I've got, but I don't commit the whole garden because I know it can turn like that. Um, the leafy stuff, your, your, your spinach, kales, cabbages, garlics, onions, chives, all of those things do better when it's cold. The flavor is better when it's cool nights, frosty. Put a little bit of snow on them, they, the flavor comes right out. When they start to get warm, they bolt, they start to become bitter, they go off flavor. That's when you start shifting those crops out. You put in your warm season crops, like tomatoes, peppers, onions, things that form a fruit. Same thing with flowers, pansies. You can put in right now. Mine are glorious. They are beautiful. They're in full bloom. Kales are just glorious. They love everything about cold nights, bright days. But then, come June, it's going to get up to 89, 92. It's going to be in the low 90s. Uh, the pansies, I don't care how much water you give them, they're going to melt down, fall over, and they're just going to come home one day and they're going to be just dead. So that's when you put in your hot stuff. Zinnias, marigolds, geraniums, all this other summer. So a very long growing season. But right now we're in that, now through the end of May is a cool season crop. Vegetables, flowers, that kind of stuff. Then May through the rest of the year, really through Halloween is our lap, is our first frost date. October 29 specifically is our 100 year average. The holiday we use locally is Halloween. It's almost always frosty about then. So then you want to really watch, do I, do I pick those tomatoes? Do I get things ready? Am I not that interesting? Are you leaving, leaving me or? Nature's if you, Oh, there we go, okay. I understand. Okay, I'll to add these things. You've been taking your notes and then I just, and I'll, I'll I'll send this to you so you're not taking notes. I'll send you the recipe. It was last week's garden call. I'll just copy and go, here you go. Um, and so you know what to add. Then I'll till all that down into one shovel's depth. And now my soil is ready to go. I won't plant right away because you've, you've made this so nutritionally valuable to the plants. It may actually be too hot, too much, especially when you're using manures. So kind of, I wanted to, I'm, I'm getting mine ready. I'll have it ready for about two weeks before I'm actually going to plant. And I'm hoping it's going to rain or snow before before I plant. If not, I'll, I'll turn the irrigation on, just kind of water it to, to balance out all those nutrients. And then I can just start planting as I go. Just right through, from now through Mother's Day, pretty much I'll just start planting. 
easily and not think about my soils. Um, questions on soil prep? Yes. If you're doing vegetables in a container, yep. what besides the soil you add, what other components? Good question. So there, you got to be really careful uh, with what you add. If you're using water's potting soil, we've taken care of all of that, all of that already. So ours is a peat moss base, so we have a real coarse peat moss in there, so drainage. It also corrects the pH, so it makes it more acidic, because peat moss is very acidic. It's got some compost in it, and we put a 555 organic food automatically in there, in the soil. There you might want to supplement about a month or two in, because you'll notice these plants, you put them in, they'll just start taking off the growth, and all of a sudden they just slow down. You know, what happened? You were doing so, you were so happy. Well, that's an indication, oh, they've used up the nutrients, go ahead and feed them again. And so there, I'll sprinkle some of the, the, the fruit and vegetable food around it. Uh, or I, I made another water soluble, it's called flower power. Uh, it's in my water can, I'll water my flowers, vegetables with that. What that's, about calcium though? Say if you have a tomato plant in a big container. Calcium, if you're doing that, I, I did sprinkle this on twice last summer. I just put some on top when I was putting those crops that were prone to blossom and drop. I just sprinkle on the ground and water it. It's kind of white colored. It looks like eggshells or something. It's not eggshells, but it kind of looks like that. Um, I'll sprinkle some on it. I never had blossom and drop on one fruit last year. If you don't do that, almost guaranteed you will have, you'll, you'll notice it. But you'll go, oh, that Ken guy, where was he at? What nursery? He was pretty smart. I should go talk to him again. But we'll just tell you the same thing. Add some more calcium. Front load calcium. Calcium, calcium, calcium. Lower pH, lower pH. Those two things should always be top of mind if you're gardening the mountains of Arizona. Okay? Yes? I've used uh, Epsom salts before for blossom and rye. Yeah. Your thoughts? So she's used Epsom salts before. My thoughts. So, I've got a radio show, got a garden column, with a million YouTube videos. I mean, just, we have an influence. In, garden, in this little part of the world, we have some influence. I used to try Jerry Baker. Remember Jerry Baker? Oh, yeah. He's an old gardener way back. He's long past, but uh, I love listening. He's entertaining. And what I found is people really don't want to waste good wine in the garden. They don't want to pee in a bottle, have it ferment in the garage, and go use it in the yard. They really don't want to... Soaps, they, they have so many fragrances and soaps anymore that burn that they don't have just regular soap anymore. It's, it's like all these different additives. And so the home recipes, I stopped advising that because so many people were making mistakes. They were burning plants. Oh, they, just, they were vaporizing plants. Okay. So if you're used to it and you do your homework, go for it. Share the information with your neighbors. But I try not to do that because Epsom salt, they really don't make Epsom salt with a garden backing as straightforward. Yeah. Same with bug killers. I only do pre-packaged, pre-designed, exactly measured, tested bug killers. Now some of those I make myself. I've made my own recipe, but I don't just recommend home remedies because it's just too awkward. There's too much stuff on the net. How do you decide which one's right? It just gets confusing. Okay. So that's my take on Epsom salt. Okay, thank you. Yep. Anything else? That was just too easy. What a great class. Nope, we're done. <laughs> yeah, no, go ahead. <laughs> um, I'm going back to the Oh, okay. This stuff, or? Yeah. Okay. I'm finding little teeny tiny black ants on okay. the trees. Oh, tiny ants on the trees. Yeah. Okay, you live in Chino Valley, right? Is that? Okay, so Chino Valley, the ants are out. That's just another indication, because ants hibernate. So it means that spring is a little early. So you can look at nature, the birds are starting to get frisky, you know, they're starting to get a little chattery. That means spring's kind of right around the corner. Um, so eight. So she's got black ants on her trees crawling up. Why? What do I do? Is it a concern? They're, the ants aren't the concern in a tree unless they're unless they get a nest up in the crotch. Sometimes they create a cavity where it's dangerous. The tree can fall on you, your house, your pets. Um, probably what's really going on, ants love aphids. So they'll crawl up the tree and harvest aphid dew, or aphid poo, but aphids. It's about time for aphids. So my guess is you've got aphids up in the tree, and if you sprayed this, it would take out the aphids. 
and it would also take out the ants, but the ants would stop going up the tree because there's no reason for them to go up there. So, I don't think so, but use your gardeners. You know, gardeners, you got to go out, walk the yard, got to touch the plants, pray over them, sing to them, got to do all that stuff. But if they're underneath the bark or in a crotch or something else, that's a concern. Now they're into the tree, they're eating the cambium layer of the tree. So they don't know enough, have to go see it. Uh, there is an ant paint. We could talk later. There's a couple different ant things we could show you that would obliterate them. So afterwards we can talk. What else? Now we're going over how to plant, actual physical plant, a tree shrub vine. Okay, yes. Yep. So can you spray vegetable herbs? Yes, it's organic. Absolutely, I would, would not think twice. Also when I'm spraying a tree, focus on the bark, focus on the main crotches, and focus right at the base of the tree. Literally, especially if there's litter or compost right, right at the trunk layer. Um, I, I pulled that back before, and sometimes the thrip, the aphids, they're actually wintering over inside that litter just underneath the ground. It looks like the ground is alive. It's like moving. It's freakish. Um, so that's the thing horror movies are made of. It's just freakish. I'll try to I'll try to spray there just to thin some of those out if they're there. It can't hurt. It can only help. And I'm really generous. I'll spray the whole yard and I'll just spray everything. I'm just especially those things that I had issues with before. Yeah. Okay. How to plant? Should we do that? So this happens to be a. Flavor top nectarine. So lots of fruit trees have come in. It's time to put fruit trees. It's time to put trees in. So we're starting to shift. We've had three truckloads of plants come in just this week. So we're starting to fill the nursery up. So there's a lot of trucks to go. It takes a lot to do that, but fruit trees, you start with that. So you can see the buds. These are all the flower buds. Oh, it just popped one off. That's not good. Um, anyway, when you're planting a tree, a shrub, whatever, I'm not looking at this. I'm really looking at this size. So this is what we're looking at, the size of the root. You only want to go dig your hole as deep as the bucket, or as deep as a root ball. Don't go deeper. This is hard for you guys who've had heavy equipment, you get back hoes. Had some guy last year, he's digging his hole. He's like chest high in this pan. What are you doing down there? Get out of there. You don't want it to go deep. You want to go, the roots don't go down there. There's nothing down there for the roots to go after, except rock, gunk, clay, caliche, you haven't heard that word till you came to Arizona, caliche, which I think in, in Apache means concrete in soil or something. <laughs> to my Indian friends, I'm sorry, that, it's a bad joke. Anyway, that's, it's hard calcium layer band in that soil that just water won't go through. So the roots always go sideways. They're going out. Huge juniper cottonwood, ponderosa pine. You dig those things out, bulldoze them over, you have to move one, the roots are down about three feet. This is a 20, 30 foot tree. The roots are down about three feet, but then they go way out. That's also why natives don't transplant. The roots are going 100 feet that way, you try to dig that out, you just severed the, the main root, most of the roots are gone, there's not enough to keep it going. So you're gonna have a failure pretty much 10 out of 10 times with a native kind of plant. With this, if you know that's how they naturally grow, uh, dig a wide hole. So you want a hole twice, three times as big, same depth, kind of saucer shaped. That's the depth. And I'll, I'll send this, got a diagram, handouts, how much mulch, how much, all the stuff you need. I'll have that for you here shortly, okay? You folks online, I'll see if I can put a link into the conversation piece down below for you all. Um, now, you've got all this pile of dirt sitting off to the side. Some of you are gonna to have to filter that. Anything bigger than a golf ball is bad. Old roots, bad. You know, I mean, some, in my yard, I was dig planting some bare grass, some native grass. I ran into bricks. The contractor buried some stuff in the yard. You can run into all kinds of stuff. So you wanna filter that out so all you have is soil that is golf ball size or smaller. I say smaller than a golf ball. How about that? Okay, some of you will have some soil left, some of you won't. You have to come in with extra. 
Uh, but you want to now take that native soil that you've got and to blend in some compost. So there I'll add the, the mulch. This is actually compost. Okay, it's screened down to quarter inch minus. It's real fine. It's going to add some organics. This is really important for you folks who bought in that track home area. They just bulldoze the prairies and just put in your homes. Literally, there's zero topsoil left in your yard. There's not one redeeming thing. There's not one mycorrhizal. You're not going to find one worm. There's zero living things in your soil. You're going to have to rebuild the soil, create a soil. This will help introduce organic so that all of a sudden worms will want to come back in. You'll see, you'll see things start to act up. So the mycorrhizal fungi, the beneficial insects that, that live in the soil, that tickle the feet of plants and get them to grow, this is going to introduce that. And for you folks who have really heavy clay soil, it'll keep the soil from compacting right back down. So it keeps it aerated so the roots can get through it. Okay? This doesn't matter where you're at, all of us have bad soil. Uh, if you're up towards uh, Granite Mountain, the soil gets kind of granite, it's sandy. There, you're adding this just so the, so the water and food didn't go whoosh right through the soil. It holds that moisture up close. It's a benefit, okay? I'm going to use about one shovel of, of mulch to three shovels of native soil, about 25%. Okay, one shovel. If you hit a big rock or something, you need to go up to 50%. That's okay. I've cheated that much to kind of give me some filler. Don't go above 50-50 mix mulch to soil. Then we want to add some top. We'll have to get some extra additives or something. But for most of us, that's going to work, okay? With that, I'll blend that together. And I'm using that to backfill around my roots, okay? Do not bury this top of this root ball, okay? This is the influence of Phoenix, okay? We'll get on that in just a second. This should be exposed. This is meant to breathe. If you put a whole bunch of soil on top of this, you can suffocate, literally suffocate the plant. I might as well take your puppy dog, pull it underneath the pool water for like three minutes and see what happens. It's going to be the same effect, only takes a little bit longer with trees. It'll take six to nine months for this to die instead of three minutes. But it, the same, it'll still die. The more evergreen a plant is, the more critical. Evergreens do not like to be buried at all. Do not let any soil touch this, this trunk. If you do, you'll get crown rot, another kind of rot. So it's just the bark down here starts to flake off. The tree becomes girdled and dies about six to nine months out. Okay, just some common, common mistakes that folks make that are new, new to the area. Just, just really important. Can't emphasize it enough. If you've got really heavy clay, like you've got to really jump on that fork, on that uh, pick or shovel to get it to go in, that's heavy, heavy clay. If you've got that, you might even want to test the soil to see the perks before you plant it. So in those areas, I'll take a hose, I'll fill it up in the morning, I'll fill that hole up, and if it's still water in there at the end of the day, you've got problems. You did not plant a digging hole, you did not plant, you're not gonna plant there, you dug a bathtub is what you dug. It's not draining enough. If you see that, you need to dig a chimney in that hole, so we'll dig down, we'll dig a, not the hole, not the hole, banking hole is too much work, we'll just take a piece of it, we'll try to dig down to the next soil band. And you'll see the soil texture. When you're driving down the road, you'll see the, uh, the cuts in the road. You'll see the different kinds of soils. You want to get down to the next layer. As soon as you do that, the soil starts to drain. Okay. If we're coming out to plant for you, we get a sense that it's really hard, we'll take the jackhammer, we'll just try to fracture, we'll try to take that jackhammer and pick through the, to the next layer. As soon as you fracture that, the water starts to seep and all of a sudden it'll drain. So, this isn't for all of us. Some of you, if you get to digging in there, you go, wow, this is, this is pretty hard. Test it before you plant. If you do plant in that, it's just going to fail. It's just going to take longer to fail. Uh, one success I had, my first home I ever owned was in Prescott Valley. Get this, dating myself, Prescott Valley used to have dirt roads back then. And no utilities. I mean, they gave you like an electrical line. That was it. And there were like three other houses on the, on, on the road. That was it. That's my first house. The soil was so incredibly hard, I killed more evergreens. Arizona cypress, pine trees, I was killing stuff right now. Uh, and I was planting everything at soil level. What I did there is I left about two inches of the root out of the ground, 
and I planted all my trees and shrubs, especially on this very slight mound, and that was a game changer. It ensured that at least, no matter how much rain or moisture that happened, at least that much of the roots could breathe, and the plant started to live. So it might be a little, that 69 corridor all the way out, the by Hills, the ranch, right on out, there's a lot of caliche and hard clay out there. So just kind of watch that one. Some things to look for, okay? When I'm all planted, I will sprinkle some of the all-purpose plant food on top of it. It's a different food. This is my number one seller. This is for evergreens, shade trees, roses really respond to this. But all the new plantings, uh, I'm putting a new thing in. The main ingredient in this is cottonseed meal. Cottonseed meal is it's got some nutritional values to help plants to root out. Uh, lowers the pH, a lot of benefits with it. I'll sprinkle that on top. Some folks like to mix it in. I like to just plant. I just want to, I want speed. I want to get in, get out. Uh, so I just go filter the soil, add the mulch, backfill, and I'll sprinkle it on top. It makes no difference, I found, which one is better. Add it to my blended soil or just on top, it doesn't matter, okay? When I'm all done, I'll water it in with root and grow. This is a composted tea, basically. It's, it helps with transplant shock. It looks like a, like a chocolate syrup, uh, but it's, it's organic and it helps the plant to, to just get rooted out. It's like major, it's like open heart surgery and brain surgery at the same time. This is the home, this plant is all, only, it's only known this. You're pulling it out, put it in your yard that has terrible soil, that plant is not gonna be happy. I don't care what you do. This helps it kind of settle down and get used to it, get to, get to forming out new roots. Okay, and that's the process. If you're in a windy area, you're planting trees, make sure you stake them, especially fruit trees. Uh, we're notorious for a prevailing southwest wind. Starts to blow here in April, doesn't stop until about the monsoons. So it's like a three, four month period where just not day and night from the southwest. So you see the trees grow to the northeast, they'll start to leaning, and then they'll load up with fruit, and then they just fall right out of the ground. They literally leap out of the ground because there's too much weight. You want to keep that scaffold, you want to keep that structure where it's balanced, so all that weight of that fruit is balanced. And a shade tree that's really big that leans like this, it just looks funny. Makes your house look, it's like a picture in the living room, hanging crooked, it'll drive you crazy. So you just want to make, stake it for one year, it's usually enough, and then you can take it off the stakes. Some of you that have bought that older home, let's say it's five, six, 10 years old, the stakes are still on the tree, it's time to pull them. So they're, they're bringing you down. Okay, we're almost an hour into this. Any questions on how to plant? Again, I'll have this, this whole thing in one sheet, eight and a half by 11, PDF form, you can just, it'll all be right there, size a hole, by plants, yes. I'm gonna turn the, can I turn these heaters off? Like, I'm starting to get hot or sweating. Just for me, if you could, and, don't, and they're right above you, don't, don't, don't mind me. There we go. So, sand. So if you mix a little bit of clay, a little bit of sand, you get cement. I, I don't think sand is gonna help us. There's no nutritional value, or the amount of sand you'd have to add to the soil to really change the texture is so great that it's hard to add enough. You're better off adding mulch. Mulch adds organics, and then that composted material is gonna aerate that soil a little better, and it's gonna attract more worms, more beneficials. You'll be better off. Uh, what I actually do with, with mine, if I'm planting myself, this is, just, this is just me, I add an extra step. I actually add, I always buy one of these every year before I plant, this is Aqua Boost. This is, uh, Polymer crystals, you all, you all have, mm -hmm. hardcore gardeners, you know what polymer crystals is an ag product. But so those, those crystals that swell up, they hold like 200 times their weight in water. That's what these are. So they, they cut down the water needs of my plants. But, but ours, we've infused them with mycorrhizal fungi, which are the beneficial microbes that help help plants grow. And so I've got a, I've got a product that helps plants root and it holds moisture in. 
So every time I plant, I'll sprinkle a little bit of this at the bottom of the planting hole, a couple of tablespoons or so. Every time I plant a tomato, whatever I'm planting, just a little bit in the bottom of the hole, and it, it helps to seed my soil with mycorrhizals, which are really beneficial. Um, if ever you've dug in your yard in a compost pile, you'll see this white stringy layer. You'll, you'll just see it go, whoa, what is that? Is that it's, not, it's not a fungi, it's not a mushroom, what is that? Those are mycorrhizal colonies. If you see those, I take them and I harvest and I sprinkle them around the yard like fairy dust. Because they're really beneficial for your for your, your plants. So that's that's one little extra step. This is more for container gardens, raised beds. It takes the edge off of watering. Especially things like tomatoes. You know, they're just big crybabies. They get dry, they wilt. They get too wet, they wilt. They drop their fruit for any reason. It just they, this kind of helps regulate that. The pansies. They're the biggest, they just are big crybabies. They're dry, they're wet, they just lay down, they're they just this helps to regulate some of that moisture. I find it helps. So yeah, back in the back. Get in the hat. Um, fruit trees established for two years, north side of my house, Chino Valley. Okay. So how often should I be watering through the winter? Oh, how am I gonna water? I was hoping I wouldn't have to answer that question. <laughs> yeah, that's like the number one question I get anywhere. Um, I haven't gotten the same answer twice for many Yeah, days. I've got a water guide, and all of us, so if you get hired on here, the first thing we do is give you a business card uh, with your face on it, your name, your contact, and on the back is a water guide, because every one of us, like 10, 20 times a day, how often should I water? So it's the same, and, so, and I want the same message across all my sales nursery folks. Here's what it comes down to, and I'll, I'll attach that. Who's got the clipboard? Let me, let me write that down just so I don't forget to send that to you. I'll, I'll add a water guide to, to, in a PDF format. So, water. Well, you guys have a brochure that you give me when you planted all my trees, but I've gotten disparate remarks. Here, here's what it comes down to. Trees, shrubs, vines, big things. Mm -hmm. You're prone to overwater. You're prone to overwater. You're overwatering. Can't emphasize it enough. People are killing things with too much water, especially in Chino Valley where water is free. You got your own well, you're just watering like crazy. Every day we're watering. Trees and shrubs do not like that. They want to breathe in between water cycles. The secret is to deep water, then let it rest so the plants can breathe. So don't mind going in for a wade, and then coming back out of the pond, and then like they need to breathe. And so if you're watering every day, that's not good. So during the growing season, for you, you've got to establish plants are two years old once a week during the growing season, April through October, once a week, right. deep soak. That's it. In the winter, twice a month should be good. If you get a major storm, you can cut one of those out. Plants are dormant, but they're still growing. They're still putting buds. This is still using water, just not using much water, but it's still using moisture. So we, we're not like Wisconsin or Minnesota or these Midwest folks that eight foot frost line, plants don't lock in and freeze. They're still using moisture. So you need to you need to water them in the winter. This is especially important for evergreens. Your privacy shrubs, uh, like uh, uh, red tip photinia, euonymus, privets, uh, junipers. Uh, if it gets really cold, like Monday, Tuesday, it looks like it's gonna get cold. That's classic, that's normal. <coughs> but if those plants are dry and it goes cold like that, We'll get what we call tip burn or, or frost burn, winter kill. There's several names for it. Basically, the tops start to burn out. You can tell the neighbors that come this spring, come March, when they start to flush new growth. You can, go, you can walk your neighbor and go, oh, he never watered. He turned his irrigation off in November, hasn't watered once. Oh, look, look at the damage. Those that spot, spot watered every once in a while, theirs don't have that burned back. Leaves, leaves are dropping off dead look at the top. If it's bad enough, it can kill them outright. Roses, kill them outright. Uh, salvias, kill them outright if it gets too bad. Just depends on the winter. So that's why we say water a couple times a month. Yeah. Turn your system on manually or water by hand if you need to in the winter. And okay, that's how you water it. I'll send that out to you. Lawns, uh, vegetables, containers, those are all variables that your gardeners, your garden hat's gonna have to come on and kind of monitor. For myself, I love pansies. Frequently, I'll, I'll plant flowers in my gardens as a canary in the coal mine. They're pretty, first of all, but I'll look at them. So pansies, again, they're crybabies. 
they're dry or cold, they just lay down and go, oh, I'm just not happy. <laughs> and they're, they're like, you can just tell by reading them, but oh, I should probably water that container garden. I should do that. And so they, I'll plant several things like that just, just to help me monitor that. And you can do the same thing. Just, just go out and read your plants. Is there anything I can lay over the root system to sweeten up the water that's going through there that's so alkaline? So I wasn't going to go over fertilizing the whole yard. Really, that's in a month. Right. Uh, but really, what it comes down to for fruit trees, use the fruit, fruit berry. Use this food, fruit, fruit and uh, this food for fruit trees. It was made for that. Your blackberries, grapes, figs, pomegranates, uh, anything that blooms, lilacs, uh, uh, recithia, things that bloom in the spring, great stuff. Everything else gets the uh, all-purpose plant food. In my yard, I took one bag of, the, of this home, and I took two bags of this, I did my whole yard, and I've already slung it all over the yard. Mainly because I got my pruning done, spring's gonna hit, and I'm not gonna have time, because I'll be helping you all. I'll be living here, basically. So I'm trying to get mine done early. You can go earlier, I just wouldn't wait and go later on your foods and stuff, does that make sense? Uh, I also get a big bag of sulfur for my own yard, just, just while we're talking food. I get a really big bag of, of salt, soil sulfur. That's this stuff. I sell like a 50, it's a 40 or 50 pound bag. And I sling that all over the yard, everything. Just over everything. It makes my evergreens just really bright green. It really brings out the blues and spruce. It brings out the flavor and, and, and fragrance of roses and fruit trees. I'll just sling it around on everything. And again, I'm trying to correct that pH, lower the pH, lower the pH. I just, and I only do that once in the spring, that's it. So I've got a, a, a fertilizing guide. So you're interested in that? Should I, probably a, it's like four step, four step program on how to feed. And your time, if, if we're truly three weeks early, you could do it now. Generally we say March one, start to fertilize. Cause you start to see the daffodils are up. Things are starting to bloom. And already the uh, winter blooming jasmine, it's already in bloom. Uh, the camellias, this opened this week. This is one of the first, these are indicators of it's spring is early. Because this is at least two to three weeks earlier than most, most years. It's just been warm. I noticed too, I brought this. This is a creeping manzanita. So it's like our native manzanita. We've got uh, three varieties of manzanita. We're kind of famous for it. I love manzanita, so we grow a lot of them. This one happens to be the ground cover. This is as tall as it gets. You can see it start to run this way. But I brought it because look, it started blooming this week. That's We don't heat this, it's just out there, but it just decided on its own, I'm ready, let's bloom. It's an indication, normally March is when you see manzanita bloom. So, but the bees are sure happy with that, okay? So another, we've got Howard Men, which is the normal, you know, big manzanita you're seeing out in the, in the forest with the red bark. We've got that one. That one's too big for a lot of yards. So we've got a, a, a smaller one, Chieftain, that gets about hip high. Big leaf, red bark, same thing. And then we've got the um, two smaller varieties. Neat one's knee high and one's ground cover. So manzanita is. Can we just go down the line real quick so you can see what's. Sure. Um, this is another native. Just while we're on natives, you'll see this growing wild out in the forest, yeah, mainly in the prairie areas. This is gray leaf cotoneaster. Uh, this is its winter color. It blooms in the spring with a white flower, and then it forms this red berry, which they're about to drop off. They'll, they'll drop off in the next month or so. Then it'll flush more of this fruit. Gets about this tall, something like that. Just an easy care. Those of you out in the forest where you've got a lot of deer, javelina, this is a great one because they don't like this. They don't eat it. So it's just a nice native. Again, this one, if you're gonna kill it, you'll kill it from overwatering. It is super drought hardy. Um, I've killed five manzanitas in my backyard. North Slope, heavy clay. They do not like it back there. I'm going to try again just to see if I can make it go. Eventually, I'll get it. I think I'm either going to plant it in a container on just a huge mound, or I'm not going to water it ever. I'm just going to plant it, just forget about it, and see what happens. I think I'm going to try that. But it's just it's so pretty. I want one. Um, this, this. This is butterfly bush. Now, butterfly bush, your grandparents grew as a monster. I mean, children, small children, dogs have been lost in butterfly bush. I mean, they just get, they're huge. This is a dwarf variety. 
This is called Buddha Blue, I believe. Is that right? Oh, Pugster Blue. It only gets this big. Super low maintenance, but with the same flower. And it's blue, not purple. That's exciting. I don't get excited about plants, but this is a new one. This is its winter color. So butterfly bush is just a real tough, robust plant for here. And butterflies, they really do like it. I mean, they really are drawn to it. Monarchs, swallowtails, they all, they all love the painted ladies. They all love that. This is another native, then I'm probably done with the natives. This is silk, a tassel bush. It's an evergreen, this is its winter color. Uh, it'll get up about, I don't know, head high, chest high or so, about like this. Super low care. And it looks like a, like a native oak, but it actually gets a tassel on it, thus the name. It gets this real pretty flower to it. It's really striking. Very, very unusual. So again, this one's, once it gets established, Ignore it. I mean, talk dirt to it. Just curse at it. It's still going to go and, and grow for you. It's just super easy to, to, to grow in your garden. Yeah, bless you. This is uh, camellia for you Californians. Uh, mo most camellias do not grow here. They're not, they'll go down to about 20 degrees or so and then they die. This one goes down to minus 10 degrees. That's a strong zone six type of plant. Um, I've grown it in Skull Valley. I had a hedgerow of it where elk and deer roamed and they never bothered it. You'd think it looks delicious, but they don't bother. The only negative with it, it doesn't like full sun. That June sun in the mountains, kind of hard on it. Uh, it does better on the east, north, where it has a little bit of filtered afternoon shade. That seems to be its favorite spot. But it also announces spring. Right after that, azaleas will start growing, will start blooming. Just kind of progression. Camellias, azaleas, then it's forsythia, then lilac. You can just tell, you can just tell us the progression of spring down the road. It's an evergreen azalea. Again, it does grow here more in the shade, less than full sun. You folks in the Midwest grow these right out in full sun. Net, you weren't up at a mile high. Our sun is more intense. So this one will burn a little bit if you're not careful. Uh, same with Japanese maple. Some things are more they don't like the intense sun at this elevation. You've got to be careful where you place them. This I got excited. These came in yesterday. Anyone know what this is? Blueberry? Blueberry. Blueberry, yeah, very good. So it's got the buds. It's about to break open and start going. But blueberries actually do very well here. One little secret with blueberries. I grow blueberries in containers. Uh, they don't like alkalinity. Blueberries love acidity. Everything about acid. And so that's not us. So if I can plant it in potting soil, that's peat moss, all of a sudden I can, con I can control that, that pH, make it more acidic, and I find it stays bluer, the, the, so the foliage stays brighter or darker blue-green, and the fruits taste better. So, insider tip. My name's Ken, we're friends, we're just talking over the back fence, and here are some things that have really worked in my yard. I think it'll translate for you pretty well too. Uh, these came in this week as well, I think on Wednesday. Pansies, you can grow right now. No problem. Uh, ivy, you cannot kill ivy. It's just evergreen. It's just a combo we put together. Went, oh, that's cute. Run a few. Two of them are already at our house. Lisa saw them come off the truck. Went, I'm taking that home. <laughs> uh, perennials, perennials, remember perennial permanent. We'll start with P. They come back every year. And so these are both perennials. I like these because they're they're mostly evergreen. They're one of the few perennials that don't hibernate underground. So most perennials, they, they're, they're under the ground. They're starting to emerge a little bit. This one had never really went subterranean. Um, this is called Pukura. Your grandparents called it coral bells. It has a little flower that kind of comes up like this. So, but they come in fun different colors and super tough. These are really tough perennials. So I'll plant these at the base of my trees, and they'll take the same irrigation my trees do, so I'll put them right where that emitter is. So I'll water the tree, and then this will get some water when I do that once a week or whatever. And they just thrive, they'll, they'll fill up that well, so it looks like, it looks like it's alive, it's a subplanting. And I think it looks funny when you take rock, we're famous for our rock lawns, you will rock right into the trunk. That looks, that just looks off to me. It's not, it's not the forest where we're at. But when you do an underplanting of anything, 
it looks natural, just brings it out. Then you can take the rock around that. This is one I use a lot with javelina art. This is uh, uh, Dusty Miller, Silver Dust, Dusty Miller. Um, it's an evergreen, so I've got some of these are three, four years old. We sell them as annuals. They only live for a year, then die, but at this altitude, they love growing here kind of permanently. I'll call it really a biannual or biperennial. Live two, three years, look like a rock star, and then it starts to get so big, it lays over, looks kind of mangy. It's, it deserves to be pulled out and start over again. So it's, I'm giving you permission, you gardeners. You, it's okay to kill a plant. They're not meant to live forever. So as they start bringing you down, rip them out, put a new one in. So for $7.99, you get a brand new rock star in the yard that will grow for another two, three years. So this one, Havelina, don't eat. Jackrabbits, antelope, deer, they do not bother this. So, and they don't bother these. Anytime you hear dianthus, carnation, or pinks, those are all named for the same plant, pretty much. Um, dianthus is an evergreen. This is its winter color. And mine have started to bloom in my own gardens like this already. It's kind of a soft launch. As we start to get into warmer and warmer, it gets covered in these flowers. So it's a great little evergreen perennial that animals don't eat. Animals don't like the color silver or blue. They just don't eat it. So look for those as indications of animal resistive kind of plants. This is Euphorbia. It's related to poinsettias. Your Christmas poinsettia. It's got the same, when you break off a branch, you have that same milky sap to it. Um, this is winter, winter color. Again, it's perennial. It's about, got some about this big, something like that. It's got this funky Dr. Seuss flower on it. It's really pretty, very unusual. But I really planted for this, this evergreen foliage to it. So animals do not, they don't eat it, okay? I brought this. This is uh, a weed. This is vinca or periwinkle if you're from the south. But I brought it just because it's starting to bloom. It's pretty neat. I like that. It's one of the first things to bloom. It's an evergreen vine. Do not introduce this in the middle of your garden or it will take over and it will choke out everything. It's a weed. So, but it's a great weed for the mountains. It does really well. And then these guys, and I think we're done. This is pansies or violas. They're kind of the same thing. This is a viola uh, or Johnny Jump Up. Sometimes that's an old-fashioned name to it. That was another name. Um, it comes in different bright colors. I find this one's even hardier than pansies. Sometimes it'll even reseed itself uh, in, in the yard. So great plant to plant early, early, early. Um, and you can companion plant it with things like kale, ornamental kale. Uh, this comes in white, green, purple, ruffled. We sell a lot of different kinds of kale. <coughs> Uh, it's not really edible. I mean, it's edible, but it tastes bitter as all get out. I actually sell an edible kale, too, that's actually sweet. This one's just to be pretty, but it goes companion-wise with this. Uh, this is one that we'll put at, like, the front entrance of retail, hotels, that kind of stuff. Because when it bolts, it'll bolt about April or May. It gets this real tall, elongated look, and then it's got a flower on it that's real bright yellow. Very fragrant. And then if you really wanted, since you're gardeners, you could cut it off at the base when it's done blooming, and usually it's got pups that will come back and come back, kind of have more, more kale heads coming up. Um, if it looks okay, keep it. If it looks off, you kind of go, that's ugly. Rip it out. Get a new one for $3.99 or whatever. And that's it. Any last questions? We are done. Whoa, that was fast. <laughs> I haven't, haven't taken a question from you yet. When you do the potting and you look at the roots, at what point do you separate those oh. or? Well, let's see if we've got one. Let's just see how they look. Well, there's a kind of an indication. This is a good, well-rooted plant. Okay, it hasn't started to spiral. It's not root-bound to where it spirals right around, around. So here, if I were to plant this, I'd go, that's perfect. I'll just loosen it up a little bit, mainly on the bottom. Sometimes the bottom will mat up on all plants. I'll open that up just so water can come in and out. And then, then I would plant this just like that. So that would be enough for this. You see the roots now starting to grow in the outer, outer direction. You really don't want to buy root-bound plants. You won't find those here at Waters Garden Center. Uh, what, what a root-bound plant is, it's a leftover from last year. 
And so usually it's a better price because it's leftover. Um, and so they couldn't sell it last year. They tried to discount it, still couldn't liquidate it. Now it's carried over to spring, and now it flushes out really nice. So it looks good. Uh, but when you look at the roots, it's starting to spin like this. And once a plant starts to spin like that, no matter how you prune it, or no matter what you do, it's just programmed. It just starts growing. It just does this. You know, quickly run out of space. It doesn't get in the outer surrounding areas. So kind of watch that one. Some plants are a little more prone to that, like willows, cottonwoods, sycamores. There, if I do see, I'm certain to see some spiral, even though it's a new, fresh planting, new, new tree. I'll just take my pruners or a razor blade or something. I'll just score or root prune the sides. And that's usually just by pruning that. It's kind of like top growth. When you cut an apple, you cut a, cut a spur on an apple, all of a sudden you get three roots, three branches coming out. Well, roots do the same thing. So when you make a root prune, you'll get two or three roots coming out of that prune area. And now it's going in the right direction into that soil. So that's how kind of how I approach it. Did I, did I answer that okay? I get it? Yeah. Last year I had Squash bugs, are they still in the soil? Squash bugs were bad last year and grubs. Oh yes. my gosh, I've never seen so many grubs. Killed more plants. Literally, I saw an eight year old locust fall over in the wind. Grubs ate the roots off of it and it just had no roots to keep it up and it fell over just like that. that I've never seen anything like that. I think that was that moisture we had. Something about last, last year's spring and moisture and snow it was unusual and squash bugs were bad squash bugs came in now here's how it works so bugs are bad so grasshoppers will be bad one year then you won't see them again for two or three years so they ebb and flow like this squash bugs do the same thing they'll be really bad one year not as bad next year we do have some sprays that will obliter obliterate them if you, if you start to see them are they still uh, they laid eggs, is what they did. And the eggs will hatch and come back at you. It's yet another reason you want to turn your soil. You want to get rid of the weeds and the insect eggs that were there. You want to till those over. If you happen to see grubs in the soil, a little white worm, look at the thing, a little C-shaped white worm when you're, when you're turning the soil, that is really bad. You want to come talk to us. You want to filter them out. and probably want to get you a, a grub killer so you don't have them eat your, eat your plants. The other one is uh, gophers are out. Pocket gophers, you see a little mound in the yard. Uh, those guys, literally it's like cartoonish. Like I've seen my broccoli disappear, like sucked under the ground, carried off. I've seen that. That is not right. Gophers are underground rats, and I'm a southern boy. They deserve to die. All rats deserve to die. And so you're not gonna take my produce that I work so hard on. So if you do see that come talk to us, we can show you how to process that. But that's only an interest of one or two of you and the rest of you are going to, I don't care about gophers. So come see us individually. Question, yeah. Yeah, real quick, blueberries, I got a couple from you a few years ago. Yeah. And they are in pots. Do they take full sun, partial shade? They didn't do too well. They're, they're pretty versatile. I find, I, I grow mine in containers on the north side. I've got a patio on the north side, but I have it out from the house a little bit. Yeah. Where they get some sun, but then they not all day sun, yeah. and that's where they seem to thrive. And then your fertilizer, you might want to sprinkle a little something, to make it more acidic. Some sulfur. Top, top some sulfur. Mm -hmm. Be careful with that because I have killed things with sulfur, adding to containers because you get it too much. Yeah. It's such a confined space. Better to go a little lighter, put some more on than go too heavy. Okay. So, but acidity, or you might even get another bag of potting soil. I was going to try to add some potting soil. Okay. Peat, more peat moss. That'll probably, it's probably a pH thing, especially since it's been a few years. For sure that soil has now gone to alkaline. You're starting to see that yellowing. The color of the leaves aren't quite yeah. like they were. The, the buds aren't quite as producing as heavily as they were. Yeah. So, okay. anything in the bag? Yeah? The, the uh, potting soil for raised beds, is that what we need any right So, potting soil for raised beds depends on the size of your bed and your budget. If money's no object, Pot, fill it with pot water's potting soil is the best. Uh, some of these beds are huge. Like, you just can't, and that's pretty expensive stuff compared to just, you go to, to a, a soil yard, they've got a gardener's mix, which is basically they dig out stock tanks, so it's silt. They'll add wood chips and horse manure. That's your garden, like, it's terrible stuff. 
Uh, you want to, maybe it's a good filler, but you don't want to garden in it because it's too heavy, too thick. Um, what I tell folks is, if you need a lot of it, go to Wilby's Compost. Wilby's, they're in the book. Wilby's Compost. He takes all the racetrack and, and uh, uh, fairgrounds bedding stuff. He composts it, and it grows pretty nice. It's a good filler. What, I, what I'll do there, i a big space, I'll fill it with Wilby's. I'll take the top eight inches or so and fill it with potting soil. So I'm putting my plugs, my starts, in the potting soil, but then I've got bulk of it filled with, with Wilby's stuff. And that's worked out really well. I've done a lot of community gardens that way. Works out really well. Yeah? Turning soil, shovel to rototillers, comment? Rototill, whatever the blade is, whatever the shovel depth is. I mean, you'll see all the English folks, they're crazy over there. They double turn with a fork, and they're, just, they're making work. I don't like that much work. This is what I'm doing that's kind of a shortcut. You could double turn it great. Rototilling is almost cheating. That's like, <laughs> it gets more more technology turning stuff over. Just go to one blade, one depth, and that's good enough. It gets you going. Okay? I'll hang out. If you have more questions, you folks online, thanks for tuning in. I'll, I'll get you the handouts here shortly. And then next week's class, I did just book Johnny's with Johnny. He's the owner of Johnny's Tree Service. He is the foremost arborist in town. He's going to come teach the uh, fruit tree class for us. He's brilliant when it comes to trees. I'm sure we'll get into pruning, fertilizing. We'll kind of co-teach co that one together. He's a really good, energetic, fast talking. We'll get it on film so you can slow it down if you need to. He's, he's got so much knowledge in his head, he just wants to get it all out fast. But he's coming to teach next week's class on fruit trees. And hopefully I'm going to get some berries, grapes, and some other stuff in before that class as well. Thanks you all for watching the platforming. Thank you very much.